Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our West Marin Wild webinar. Uh, today, we're going to be getting an insider's look into our marine protected areas in Cordell Bank with Morgan Patton and Jenny Stock. And we're so glad you guys could be with us today. I see some folks are still coming in, so we'll give it just a second. And in the meantime, I'm gonna go over a little bit of some of our technical um, items here. Is One, remember, we're all online, so we never know what will happen, but we hope the webinar goes without fail and we don't lose internet connection or anything like that. But as you can see, we're all working from home still, um, still getting our missions done, and thank you so much for your support in that. Um, you'll see that we are in a go-to webinar today. So there's an area for questions and there's an area for chat. So um, if you have a question during um, the presentation, go ahead and put your question in there um, and we'll answer those questions at the very end just to keep the flow of the program going. And then at the end, we'll moderate those questions for our panelists. Um, of course, you can always use the chat too um, to say thanks or thumbs up or something like that or add a little tidbit for the group if you have an interesting fact. Um, I will look there for questions too, but ideally if you could put questions in the questions area, I'll know that we need to get to those. Um, <clears throat> so I think without further ado, um, by the way, I'm Jessica Taylor, I'm, uh, Development Director for the Environmental Action Committee of West Marin. Again, I'll be moderating today um, and I'm happy to um, introduce EAC's executive director, uh, Morgan Patton. She's currently the co-chair of the Golden Gate Marine Protected Area Collaborative and a conservation representative on the Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council. She's a fifth generation Marin County resident and an environmental advocate that was raised in Sonoma Valley and in West Marin. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to her so she can teach you a little bit more about our California uh, marine protected areas. Thank you, Jess. Well, thank you, Jessica, for that excellent introduction. Really excited to be here today to talk to you guys about California's network of marine protected areas. As Jess mentioned, my name is Morgan Patton. I'm the executive director of the Environmental Action Committee of West Marin. EAC was founded in 1971 as a local grassroots um, environmental organization, and we work to protect and sustain the unique lands, waters, and biodiversity of West Marin. Since 2013, EAC has partnered with the Point Reyes National Seashore and California Academy of Sciences to run a MPA watch program or Marine Protected Area Watch program in Marin County, and that's a network of programs that support healthy oceans um, through community science by collecting data on human use in and around our MPAs. In addition, as Jess mentioned, I am also a co-chair for the Golden Gate MPA Collaborative, which is one of 14 collaboratives um, in the state that includes more than 600 members, 385 organizations, and we work together to help steward the network of uh, California's 124 MPAs. So today, we're gonna talk a little bit about California Marine Protected Areas, briefly about just to set the baseline of the current state of our ocean, about uh, California's MPA network, uh, a little bit about MPAs on the horizon, some interesting um, state legislation, and then how you can get involved. So the California coast and ocean are among some of our most treasured resources. The productivity, wildness, and beauty found here is central to California's identity, heritage, and economy. Millions of people depend on the ocean and its resources. With an increasing human population, the demand continues to grow at a profound rate. Our ocean ecosystems are changing due to stressors that include uh, ocean acidification, warming waters, invasive species, and overfishing, and others. Industrial accidents like oil spills damage habitats and harm species. Human waste like plastic pollution litters our ocean, impacting species and habitat health worldwide. Lost fishing gear, ghost nets, entangle species globally and creating unnecessary mortality. And overfishing of marine life, ha life has depleted fisheries worldwide. These are graphs from the 1970s to 2000 that show a steep decline in predatory fish biomass um, globally. So basically, we're taking too much out and at a rate faster than fish populations can recover. 
uh, this is a photograph from a fishing derby in 1950 that was shared with me from Prairie's Mary's National Seashore. And this is that same contest in the 1980s. And this is that same fishing contest in 2000. So you can see that the um, most of the big fish that were caught historically are no longer there. The combination of these factor factors has resulted in record losses of biodiversity and marine habitat. This is an image of an urchin barren in Northern California where a kelp forest once thrived. Since the 1960s, California has lost more than three quarters of our kelp forests. So what can we do? We need to protect the diversity and abundance of marine life, the habitats they depend on, and the integrity of marine ecosystems. And one step in the right direction is to support the network of marine protected areas right here in California. In California, the 1999 Marine Life Protection Act, or MLPA, directed the state to redesign the California network of M or the California MPAs to increase their coherence and effectiveness, and to the extent possible, function together as a network. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife defines MPAs as named discrete geographic areas designated to protect or conserve marine life and habitat. We have 124 MPAs in California, which is 852 square miles or 16% of our coast. We have um, a bunch of different types of MPAs or designations. Um, these were established through a collaborative and regional public stakeholder process that was launched. Um, so region by region, uh, we went through and looked at each of the different needs in each geographic area, and then these MPAs were set up. And this was done through a huge stakeholder process and included um, anyone who's utilizing our coastal resources. So you have no take reserves, limited take reserves, and in Northern California, in our area, we have a few special closures, which are no take um, and no access. And those are um, restricted to special bird nesting sites. Uh, one thing to note, all MPAs are open for public recreation and access with the exception of special closures. And this is a map of the North Central region, which is our region of MPAs. And you can see the color coding here and the, um, all of the different designations for the different types of MPAs. The red areas are the state marine reserves that do not allow extractive uses or taking of resources and fishing. Blue areas are state marine conservation areas, which allow seasonal take of some species. And as I mentioned, this was a collaborative stakeholder process done geographically. So in our case, those seasonal allowed take um, would be mostly crab and salmon fishing. Um, and then as I mentioned before, we also have our special closures. One thing I do wanna say as a note is if you are planning on fishing, don't rely on this presentation for um, the exact regulations. You will need to go look them up to make sure you're following the rules. So like parks protect wildlife and habitat on land, MPAs protect coastal and marine wildlife and habitat. And by protecting sensitive ocean and coastal habitats, marine life and species that depend on healthy coasts and oceans may flourish and create overall healthier systems. So MPAs on the horizon, so what's coming? Um, the California Assembly Bill 3030 um, would declare California's goals to protect at least 30% of the state's land areas and waters by 2030. So we protected 16% of our coastline, but we can do much better. That is not enough. MPAs do need to be expanded to zero extinction sites in important bird areas, as well as, as reefs, seagrass beds, seamounts, freshwater ecosystems, and coastal wet, wetlands. AB 3030 begins this dialogue. And the bill would improve protection of our biodiversity with the creation of a state policy to protect at least 30% of the land and water in California and 30% of the ocean waters off the coast of California by 2030, with specific objectives to protect biodiversity, increase, cli increase climate change, promote collaboration, increase opportunities to sequester carbon through natural measures, and enhance public access for all people in the state, with a specific emphasis on increasing access for communities of color and economically dis disadvantaged communities. In May, more than 50 organizations signed a letter of support for AB 3030, and you can take action by calling or writing to your California representatives to support AB 3030 this month. The latest news that I have heard on the status of this bill is that it's on its way to the Senate. So it's a perfect time for you to do that. You can find your representative um, at this website I put on our screen, which is findyourrep.legislature.ca.gov. Other ways you can get involved. 
to the MPA Collaborative Network. So the MPA Collaborative Network includes grassroots organizations in each coastal county of California that are helping to manage MPAs, along with different management agencies like California Department of Fish and Wildlife. There's 14 collaborative groups, including the Golden Gate Collaborative, which I co-chair with David McGuire of Shark Stewards and Paul Hobie of Seabird Protection Network. And the Golden Gate Collaborative is made up of agencies and stakeholders working together to promote and protect MPAs. Oh, and let me go back there, sorry. And you can learn more by going to mpacollaborative.org and you can sign up for newsletters. Um, and if you're not from the this region, um, there are 14 collaboratives, so you can join one um, throughout the state. You can also get involved with MPA Watch or Marine Protected Area Watch. So if you need an excuse to take a long walk on the beach, then this is the program for you. So MPA Watch is a network of programs that support healthy oceans through community science, by collecting human use data in and around our protected areas. MPA Watch is a community science program. Volunteers collect scientific data on coastal and marine ecosystems, and the collected data helps to inform MPA management that supports the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And you can get to know your MPAs and learn a little bit more about MPA Watch at um, mpawatch.org or locally if you go to EAC's website at eacmarin.org. Um, I guess forward slash MPA watch. And so that wraps up my portion. Um, so in closing, please do not take our post emotion for granted. Protect what you love, find a way to get involved, and hopefully you can also get out to help support AB 3030 in the coming days. Uh, now we're going to move on and learn from Jenny Stock, who's the Education and Outreach Coordinator for NOAA's Cornell Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, right here off the coast of West Marin, and she's been with them for about 20 years, providing a wide variety of education and outreach programs to audiences locally, nationally, and internationally through field trips, curriculum, teacher trainings, and through a variety of digital media um, and exhibits, including at the Lighthouse. So if you're out there, uh, Cornell Bank was instrumental in some of that uh, work that happened on the new uh, visitor center out there. She was also on the Nautilus, uh, where they were exploring the deepest parts of the marine sanctuary. And now we're gonna dive deep with her um, and see uh, and learn more about our Cornell Bank. So good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to be here with you. I'm just getting a little oriented here on my screen. And uh, stand by one second. Okay. Awesome. So I am so happy to be here with you. And it's kind of a warm day here in Petaluma. I'm um, sheltering in place at home with my family and working. And I'm psyched to go offshore with you and share with you some of the deeper parts of our National Marine Sanctuaries off the coast that are beyond our state MPAs that Morgan is talking about. And last year, I got to go on an expedition with our sanctuaries that I'm going to share with you some of the highlights from that today. So I am the Education Outreach Coordinator, as Jessica mentioned, and the Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary Office is co-located at Point Reyes National Seashore, and we're all sheltering in place, working from home, so I'm not quite there in West Marin right now, but miss it quite very much. <laughs> And um, as part of my work, I've been able to do so many different education related work items. And one of the things that has been the most exciting and fun for me is to be part of these at sea expeditions where we're able to communicate directly with people all around the world through the technology on the ship. So while I was out there, I was doing live presentations with museums and um, classrooms that were um, linked in to the ship just through a Google, Google Meet link. And we also were all mic'd up. You can see in that picture there that I had a microphone on and everybody in that room had a microphone on and we were talking live to people that were watching the broad, the broadcast live online at nautiluslive.org. So I have to say it's probably one of my career highlights to be able to be out exploring in the ocean and talking to people at the same time. So now I get to share a little bit of a wrap up with you. So just a little bit about our system. I'm with the National Marine Sanctuary System, which is part of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And we currently have 15 National Marine Sanctuaries and a couple marine national monuments and a couple places that are in the waiting wings for potential designation down the line. And you'll notice that some of these places are in the, the Great Lakes and our sweet water seas. And so that's part of the National Marine Sanctuary 
mission is to also protect freshwater areas too. But you can look on the west coast of the United States, we have five national marine sanctuaries and that's a true testament to how amazing the waters here are off the coast. Each one of these places was designated with communities coming, proposing to protect certain areas that either had incredible maritime heritage or artifacts or amazing biological life. And so predominantly for us here on the coast, it's a lot of biological life, but a lot of maritime heritage as well. So this is World Oceans Month. I'm glad it's more than just a day at this point, and a lot of activity is going into talking about the ocean. And so what I wanted to share with you um, in theme of that month is just some of the ocean literacy principles that really uh, take home how, why the ocean is so important to us. The earth has one big ocean with many features. The ocean and life in the, in the ocean shape the features of the earth. The ocean is a major influence on weather and climate. The ocean made earth habitable. The ocean supports a great diversity of life and ecosystems. The ocean and humans are inextricably connected. And the ocean is largely unexplored. So these are the seven essential principles and concepts that the ocean community wants everybody in the world to know about because we are really inextricably inextricably connected to the health of the ocean. There's a large education effort around this and you can learn more about it at the website down below or also you can just Google ocean literacy. <clears throat> but when I was thinking about my talk today, I realized, huh, I'm actually touching on a lot of these themes today. So you're gonna hear me talking about each of these um, principles that I've starred here throughout the talk today. So right off the coast here, we have two national marine sanctuaries right next to each other, actually three, Monterey Bay to the south of the Greater Farallons. And I really love this image because it shows the interface of the land and the ocean. And I want to just recognize the traditional lands of native communities who have su substantial traditional knowledge and local knowledge about the ocean and its health that we should be paying attention to. And I personally am speaking you to from the lands of coastal Miwok, and I know West Marin is coastal Miwok as well. And it's important knowledge to continually um, keep in our conversation about the use of the ocean and how it's being used today and how it's been traditionally used in the past. So these national marine sanctuaries are right um, contiguous to the coast, but also go quite a bit far offshore. And one of our main missions is to understand what lives in these areas so we know how to best protect them within the means that we have through the National Marine Sanctuaries Act. <clears throat> our waters off the coast here are incredibly productive, supporting whales from far away. These are humpback whales and, and shearwaters that are coming here to feed, blue whales that come up here from Costa Rica uh, to feed in the, in the waters for krill. Uh, Cordell Bank, Jessica didn't want me to do a presentation without showing the bank. So Cordell Bank is our prominent feature of the sanctuary that is really just a beautiful jewel that has a temperate rocky reef community on it. This is an area that pops up to just under 200 feet below the ocean. So there's still quite a bit of sunlight there where there's a lot of plankton. And this temperate rocky reef community supports these beautiful invertebrates that just come on top of each other and, and living and depending on each other, which creates more habitat for fish. So there's a lot of interconnections on the bank. And these images really remind me of how special this place is and how interconnected it is um, as an ecosystem, just like we are on land and how interconnected we are with uh, depending on each other and depending on the earth. So um, when we take away all the water and we look at the seafloor, um, there's quite a bit of area that we have that a lot of people just don't think about because you can't see it. It's all covered up by the ocean. And people that are in the ocean world, I look at images like this and I'm constantly like, oh, what's down there? What's in that groove and what's in that canyon? And um, that's because we're always interested in learning more about what we have in our area. And <clears throat> for the talk today, predominantly, I'm gonna be talking about the deeper parts of the ocean. And so, this is a little uh, way to just highlight the different zones of the ocean. And I wanted to ask you all what you thought, um, what, how deep is the deep ocean? And I have access to our um, poll, our chat here, as well as our questions. And I'd love for you to answer this question. Just type in what you think. 
How deep is the deep ocean? Is it deeper than you can scuba dive? A, B, greater than 200 meters, about 650 feet? <clears throat> C, greater than 1,000 meters? Or D, greater than 2,000 meters? And just take a moment, I'd love to see what your thoughts are. What do you think is the deep ocean? Type into the chat area what your thoughts are about the deep ocean. All right, we've got D, we've got greater than a thousand. Oh, we got a couple answers. A, um, D, greater than 2000, greater than 2000. Excellent, all of you are, are on the right track. Well, it's actually a two part answer and it depends if you are a, thanks for your responses. If you're a biological oceanographer or a chemical or a physical oceanographer. So typically when we talk about the deep sea, we're talking about water that is greater than 200 meters if you are someone who's studying biology in life, because that's about where the light is filtered out and starts to get very deep below that time, below that depth. And people that study the ocean physically, all the physical parameters of the ocean, think of the deep sea is greater than 2,000 meters. So we work with all of those people that are interested in all the water in between because of all the interesting things we can learn about that um, region of the ocean. So deep sea communities along our west coast are providing incredible habitat for fish and invertebrates at these incredible depths. And we have just started to scratch the surface to discover these long hidden communities that are in the depths, mainly because of technology and the incredible expense of using this technology in the ocean. We've just scratched the surface, starting to know about these really amazing communities in the great deep um, parts of the ocean. But we do know that they're inextric inextricably connected uh, hosting so many other animals and host a lot of um, communities where fishes can grow up to become bigger fishes for fishing um, fisheries. So deep sea communities help support fisheries as well. So it's something that we're really interested in learning more about. In addition to learning about the, the animals that are there, what, what types of species we have, because there's so many things we just don't even know. A lot of us don't even think about coral, but we do have coral in cold deep water. We have quite a bit of it. And there's a difference. So when we think of coral, typically we think of these coral reef tropical areas and shallow warm water uh, in an image like this. And species of coral that live in these shallow areas really depend on the symbiotic algae that lives inside the coral tissues. And that algae photosynthesizes and gets energy from the sun and brings that energy into the coral to live. And that's one of the ways they eat. They also have polyps that can collect plankton too. But that's <clears throat> the predominant way uh, shallow water corals live. But in the deep sea where there's no sunlight, it's very different. They don't have any sunlight and no, no symbiotic algae to live with. And so they completely depend on what rains down from above from the upper waters of the ocean. And this is where it's very connected to the surface waters. So um, they rely on what we call marine snow. And marine snow, is stuff that dies up above, plankton, fishes, invertebrates, whales, seabirds, things that die in the ocean because everything eventually dies, decays in the ocean and eventually rains down to the bottom of the ocean and becomes food for this incredible community. So I have a little video here just to show you what marine snow looks like as it's raining down from above. <clears throat> it kind of picks up speed when it gets down to depth because of the gravity pushing it just a little bit quicker than the surface waters where there's less gravity. So it's kind of a neat little outer space area. So a little bit more about corals. They're found all around the world in deep waters with temperatures down to negative one degrees Celsius. There are more than 3,000 species of deep sea corals that we know of at this point, and new ones are being discovered every year. In my time at the sanctuary, we have discovered a couple new corals in the sanctuary new species of corals, then they can be extremely long lived. One colony of deep sea black coral was found to be more than 4,000 years old. So very slow growing animals and very long lived. Not a lot of change happens in the deep sea. It's a very stable environment, at least as we know of right now. So when we're planning these expeditions and thinking about the ocean, a lot of us mainly think of this ocean and this water and wonder how do we know where to go underneath the water? It's very hard to predict where these places may be. 
And I showed you some of those maps earlier that show you some of the bathymetry, the contours of the seafloor. And we really rely on this, these, the seafloor mapping to help us to plan where to go on these deep sea missions so that we can maximize our time out at sea and target the areas that we think could have interesting habitat. So we have, it's, exploration is a two-part process. We have to first have good mapping data to know where to go. And so in my time here at the sanctuary, we've had a couple efforts where um, we've collaborated with other agencies to get good mapping data to have really good pictures of the seafloor. And this is really important for fisheries management as well because they wanna help protect areas that are areas that might have a lot of good fish. <clears throat> so multi-beam is the type of technology which basically is sending down little sound waves to the seafloor and it measures the rate of return and makes the picture of the seafloor, which is making those beautiful maps that we see um, showing us what below the ocean looks like. So that is the first part of ex um, planning this expedition. So we have this opportunity with the exploration vessel Nautilus. Uh, the Ocean Exploration Trust owns this boat. It's run by Bob Ballard, who's a famous ocean explorer. And it's an amazing boat and hosts about 31 people on board and about 16 scientists and then a crew that runs the ship 24 hours a day. And the really amazing thing that this ship has, of course, is this incredible technology, but we use a two ROV, a tandem ROV system. When we're out at sea and we're sending something super down deep, um, we really rely on a lot of technology to keep us in one place because the ocean is moving and the ROV needs to stay put. So that the uh, tandem ROV, the second one up above, this one here, um, helps to keep things a bit stable down here so that this ROV, this is called Hercules and this is Argus. Hercules is our main workhorse and needs to be super stable. And Argus kind of takes a little bit of the tension that comes from running up to the ship. So it's amazing amount of work. We can't just pull these ROVs out of the water in two minutes. They take a couple hours to put down in the water and to, and to retrieve. So it's pretty exciting technology. I'll show you a little launch of what it looks like launching the ROV on a beautiful day. This is like epic weather out at Cordell Bank because you can see the skyline and there aren't any white caps quite yet or wind. This is a really nice conditions for launching. So that's Hercules and you can see some of the instruments on there. There's an arm and you can see some of these push cores over here, which help get sediment samples. And then this is a long tether that comes all the way up to the ship and that tether has a fiber optic cable in it. And that fiber optic cable reads up into the main control room where we have monitors hooked up so we can see the live video feed. And then the ship also broadcasts that off to a satellite so you can see it from home. And people can watch that at nautiluslive.org. They're gearing up for the season this year, although it's gonna be a bit different with our COVID-19 uh, global pandemic happening. I don't think there's gonna be many people on the ship um, this expedition season, but there will be exploration going on. So that's the launch. It takes quite a few people, a lot of coordination. And I will tell you, it is very stressful when the wind picks up. Uh, it's out there with a very tricky recovery and it was very stressful because this is mega mega technology, a lot of money. So here's a little close up of the cameras and the lights. Um, this is the, the um, main shelf here where there's a bio box that can come out and we can put samples in that we need to collect to identify them. Um, this is called the slurp and it can slurp up soft organisms um, and put them into a, a holding container for processing later. Here's a picture of the bio boxes with some of the coral samples that we took. And these are the push cores. So there's a lot of different cool uh, gear on the ROV that helps us to really maximize the time we're down there and learn as much as we possibly can. This is in the control room where we have the pilots and the navigator and the scientists and the data collectors and the science communicators. And uh, we're on top of the ship. So we're moving around like this. You kind of get used to it and looking um, on these big screens. And we're also connected to scientists on land. We work with scientists ashore. So there might be people in other states or around the world that are looking and saying, oh, that is a sample that I really need. Um, and we can communicate with them about that live on the, on, the, on the go. So it's pretty exciting. So after the dive, and dives can be over 24 hours, um, and it takes a couple hours to get down to some of these deeper depths. So we really wanna maximize our time and dive as long as possible, watch the sea conditions. 
and then it takes a couple hours to retrieve the vehicles and then we spend a few hours processing all the samples that come off and these samples are predominantly around identification so uh, corals and sponges we have to identify under a microscope not us but experts we work with gary williams at the california academy of sciences who is a deep sea coral expert and he works with um, under a very high power microscope to look at the very tiny um, polyps to be able to identify what species um, we have. Some of them we, after a while, we get to know because we've identified them once and we know them, but others are, are still mysterious. So when we get to look at these samples, it's also an exciting time to look at these samples really close up. And one of the things that I'm always really impressed about is the sponge. We have amazing marine sponges down at depth, but if you check it out, you can really see these amazing glass spicules that stick out. And so we have to handle sponge really carefully because those little spicules, they can get in your skin and it causes irritation for days, um, which is really frustrating. But um, it's really fun to be able to look closely at these organisms and see brittle stars and worms and other little tiny critters and just so many relationships happening on these individual species. So our mission for our expedition in October was to explore unexplored areas, areas that we've never seen, and assess areas that were being considered for fisheries management changes in the greater Farallons region. And when we say explore, we're looking at habitats not seen before. So we're looking at species, we're looking at the habitat quality and type, looking for debris or damage, um, samples that we might collect are sediment samples, um, species and water samples for chemistry. And a really cool technology is through a water sample, it's called eDNA, which is basically collecting the water and then it's analyzed back in a lab to look at the DNA in the water. And that allows us to know what other species are around that we just didn't see in the field of view of the ROV. Um, so it's pretty amazing technology to learn more about what lives in the ocean by taking just a sample, pretty cool. So I want to show you some highlights and pictures and videos of some of the things that we saw uh, in the Greater Farallon Sanctuary, which is rather large. So Greater Farallon started out um, down here up to Bodega Bay and up in, up till 2015. And then and after a very long public process, we both Greater Farallons and Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuaries expanded to their current sizes that you see here right now. And so now it goes all the way up to Point Arena and encompasses this amazing part of the coast. And so <clears throat> we did uh, two dives in the Greater Farallons region. One was a deep dive that started at uh, almost 6,000 feet and then came up to a fa fairly shallow habitat around 500 feet. And then the other one stayed in a relatively shallow area, still considered deep sea, but um, shallower than most deep sea dives. And so this was a pretty, a pretty fun to explore in that rocky area. So just a few little highlights. This is a cat shark egg case. And there's a little video that runs with this to see a couple more and you can see how there's sediment that covers the sponge there's some sponge here and some these are called brachiopods a type of mollusk and there are more cat shark egg cases and we see we've seen these a couple times up in the farallons uh, region off the sonoma coast a lot of cat shark egg cases attached to these rocky habitats it's pretty cool and then a cool rockfish and so here's a little cat shark that we saw and amongst a bunch of urchins on the seafloor. And there's some, you see some jelly-like uh, tinafores floating by. I don't know if they eat urchins. I'm not really aware of that. I don't, I don't think they do. And um, so this is back in some rocky habitat. This is a cool little decorator crab. And at first you may not see it, but this is gonna be my Halloween costume this year. You just cover yourself in what you're surrounded by and you have great camouflage. This is vicious. I'm not sure if you can hear audio on this, but it's you can hear the scientists so talking. An anemone, not a crab. It's a crab eating an anemone. Uh, so that is a... Um, any idea on species? It's a decorator crab. <laughs> we don't know the specific species that it is, but it's yeah, covered in full like sponge. This is in shallow water, yeah. relatively speaking. So I'm not it's good like at that. Just tearing off chunks. I think because the it's, the smooth part is too hard to bite off. Too smooth to get a 
get it. So, oh, but it ripped it. She taken part from the inside. I think that crab is devouring an anemone. All right. And we also saw a flapjack octopus, which are a fun little octopus. They get that name because they can really flatten themselves like a pancake. And there's a little rockfish hanging out by it. And there's a little brachiopod here that mollusk I was telling you about. So take a look at the flapjack octopus. We see them sometimes on the seafloor, but we also have seen them in the water column um, swimming along. I think, and I can't remember the lasers there, I think they're 10 centimeters apart to get an idea of size there. These two green dots are lasers and those help us to measure things to get a, a perspective of size. I think they're 10 centimeters apart. In some of the shallower areas of the Farallones, we also saw a lot of giant Pacific octopus. This is a, a burrowing cucumber. You can see some sea stars here. Looks like a tunicate right there, another cucumber. And this one starts out as a close up of a crab, but it's going to pan out. And this was something that was amazing to see during the Farallon's dive. We had, uh, this is October, so it's still kind of a very productive time of the year. And um, we had a lot of krill. So it gives you a perspective of what the krill, how dense the krill was. And it was so dense at times, we could barely see like three feet in front of the cameras um, because of the density of the krill, which was awesome. There's, there you can get a good idea of how dense it is. And those are canary rockfish, those orange ones with the white stripes, which are considered a fish that's been over, overfished in California. And a lingcod, I'll play that again because it's so fun. fun to see the fish eating the krill too. Sorry about that. And there's just a picture of what one little krill looks like. They're just about two centimeters, um, but they are one of the most important species we have on the West Coast because of the food it provides for so many animals, um, fishes, seabirds, whales, um, as you're about to see, sea stars eat krill as well. And one of the things that West Coast National Marine Sanctuaries have done to help protect krill on the West Coast is to work with the Fisheries Management Council to ban the commercial harvest of krill on the West Coast, to protect it, to keep it for available for these habitats and these animals. Um, commercial harvest, harvest of krill happens in other parts of the world to harvest it to make vitamins to sell to people because of the incredible nutrients that krill has in it. But um, when we commercially harvest it, it means there's less krill available for wildlife. So, that's one of the things our National Marine Sanctuaries have done on the West Coast, working with the Fisheries Management Council to find areas where we really wanna protect the species here that are available, valuable for fish and so many other habitats um, protecting them. So this was one of the coolest things that we talked about and we had people um, watching from around the world that are echinoderm experts just completely floored. But this is called a Rathbanaster sea star, and it typically is scavenging along the seafloor. But we saw it eating krill. Yeah, they're little. Krill so you'll see these tentacles awesome. sticking out with krill stuck to it. So it's actually catching them. Wow! So we have this Pycnopodia catching krill, actively catching krill. <laughs> you can see the tentacles going yeah. up. Oops. Yeah, and then we'll just slowly pass it down to the mouth. I don't think I've ever seen this before. Mm -hmm. I have not. Jamie, have you seen this before? No, I think it's very cool. Mm. Everybody's been wanting to see a predation event. Yeah. Got it, Kelly. <laughs> All right. So we just saw an amazing diversity of sponges and corals and animals working together. And it really just helped to emphasize how important these habitats are to 
make sure we're making the best decisions to help sustain them over time. So in Cordell Bank, we did two dives as well. This was a, a rather short cruise. It was just about five or six days. And when we have a cruise like that, um, one whole day is, well, not even a whole day, but a good time is transiting to the places we need to go. And then we try to maximize those times. So we only did two dives, but they were long, long dives. And so for Cordell Bank, we did a dive in an area called Box Canyon, which is west of the Continental Shelf. And that was to about 7,000 feet. And then we did a second dive in Bodega Canyon. We had dove Bodega Canyon two years prior, but this one was in a deeper area to 10,000 feet, which is over two miles under the ocean surface. So that was really exciting to see. And I just have a bunch of pictures here to show and a little video of some of the cool things that we've seen down there. So this is a type of snail and a, a snail tower, which is an area where it lays its eggs. You saw sea spiders, which look like cool spiders on the seafloor, um, stalked crinoid, solitary hydroid and sponges. And if you look at these body types, you can kind of get an idea of what they feed on and how they move. And a lot of these animals are relying on that marine snow, um, but the sea spider can move around a little bit and it might be a little bit um, able to eat bigger things as well. I don't, I don't know what it is underneath there um, in that picture in that sea spider. So a lot of cool octopus species. Um, as one of the deep sea species that we see a lot is the Grenolidone Boreo Pacifica, and that's that purple octopus. And if you were watching the news, you might have seen the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary had uh, discovered a breeding area um, hotspot on this deep sea vents in the Davidson Seamount area for um, these octopus. And we also saw flapjack octopus. A lot of cool sea cucumbers, which are the great scavengers of the sea. And these animals, they filter in sediment and anything that falls to the seafloor and get whatever nutrients they can. And um, out the same hole that they feed in, they also um, excrete their waste, which is an interesting strategy. A lot of different types of anemones. These are palm palm anemones on top. And another type of anemone that burrow, burrows into the seafloor. And a lot of different types of corals. You know, before we started doing our research in Bodega Canyon and Box Canyon, we just had a couple deep sea corals that we knew about. And now we know of over 20 species that we have seen on our limited dives. Um, the one up on top there is a bamboo coral. And it is um, one of the bigger ones. And it has a big white calcium carbonate base. And if you look closely, you might see these little nodes here. Those are little, what we call proteinaceous nodes, which is made of the same stuff our fingernails is made out of. And we are working with scientists at Bodega Marine Lab, Karina Fish, who's doing her PhD at uh, Bodega Marine Lab. And she's using these corals to study historic um, ec ecology, the conditions of the ocean in, in the past, because they're fairly long lived. And so by studying those nodes, you get to really know them um, and their past of how they ate. We also have these little cup corals down here and mushroom corals and get a really neat chance to see their beautiful tentacles. This is a cool finding and I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way to make two worms really cool, but this was a really cool finding for the um, Cordell Bank dive because we'd never known about two worms in our area. Two worms normally live in areas that are hydrothermal vents, which they basically feed off of the chemistry in the water or the chemistry in the rock that they're attached to. So we found a couple areas with tube worms in Box Canyon. <clears throat> and that might mean they're feeding off, there might be um, gas seeps down there. There might be methane seep in there. We're not 100% sure, but it definitely raises a lot more questions about the geology of this region, having seeing the presence of these really cool worms. Um, one of the neat things that we've seen are these range and depth extensions of species. And that's when we start getting cameras down below and starting to see these species. Um, and a lot of these were all collected so that they could be verified. Um, we're starting to learn that the range of these animals is much greater than we originally thought. So these specific species here seen are were ones that were found to be of greater um, geographic range or depth. Um, that was not known before by seeing them in Bodega Canyon and Box Canyon. And we identified a new species of sponge. Actually, um, a collaborator, um, Henry Ricewig, is a sponge expert, and he identified this as a new sponge species and named after the Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And then some of the vertebrates that we saw down there, we saw blob sculpin and snailfish, 
different skates and cat sharks, um, fish like grenadier and rockfish. Um, when we did a dive that was a little closer around the shelf, we saw some other types of rockfish in, in density, which were um, very thick to go through when we were going down to the seafloor. And here's a little video highlight showing um, just a, cute, a few of the video clips from Bodega Canyon. So this skate is most likely a rough tail skate and it's most likely a male based on the long claspers. What's the parasite, the little like worm in the back, little tag on the back there? I'm live, just so you know. Thank you. It's like a beautiful, massive coral. It's beautiful. Oh, wow, look at you guys, that's great. <laughs> I wonder what they're communicating. There. Right. <laughs> great video going somewhere, please. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it's really close. And crinoids next to it too. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of lights. And the colors, cool. that is beautiful. Wow. Awesome. So the little red dots are little sclerites. So those are some beautiful highlights showing some of the beautiful macro photography they can do with the cameras on the ROV. So really the significance of all this is in order for us to protect these places, we have to know what's there. And this has definitely advanced our knowledge about the significance of these deep sea habitats in the sanctuary. And through the communication we're able to do from the ship, um, helping to increase appreciation and interconnectedness to these ocean environments by sharing with people live on the ship and, and later on down the line. Uh, there are a lot of threats to deep sea communities around the world. We definitely have ocean conditions changing with uh, oxygen and warming and ocean, ocean acidification changing the chemistry. We are, have threats of oil spills. We saw a lot of this picture up here is um, corals that were damaged in the deep sea horizon oil spill in Texas. So that stuff falls to the seafloor. Um, certain types of fishing practices are extremely dangerous to deep sea communities. Uh, trawling activities can just wipe out these really sensitive habitats. And then when gear is accidentally lost and abandoned, it also um, falls to the seafloor and can smother these vibrant communities or in some cases wipe them right off. We did see a bit of marine debris um, down there, not too much, but a little bit. And you can see how life will persist as, as much as it can um, some things just grow right on top of that debris and keep going, but it is indicative of our presence that we have in the deep sea, even though it's far away from us. So just in conclusion, thinking about all the things that I shared here and some of our ocean literacy principles, um, we predominantly are focusing on all these, but all of these are just a huge part of our everyday lives and, and this month of World Oceans Month and thinking about things we can all do to better protect the ocean. Just remember, it comes back to our health as well, and not just the ocean's health and the animals, but also to our health. And I wanted to say thank you to all the collaborators that are part of this mission to do this. This is so much a part of working together with a lot of different people, the National Marine Sanctuaries, the Ocean Exploration Trust. We share the, um, the mapping data with USGS, or they share it with us so we can best target these areas the Greater Farallons Association that supports the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary and the California Academy of Sciences. Um, just an amazing team of people. It's just a, a wonderful experience to be able to work together with such incredible professionals to do such great work offshore so we can best protect it. And I think we can take some questions at this point. And what we've discovered is with this um, set up here at GoToWebinar that I'm the only person who has access to the questions. So I'm gonna open them up and take a look here. Um, feel free to type them in and it might take me a while to see them, but let's see. Are you finding microplastics in the samples? Um, that, I don't know. I don't know if we were sampling for microplastics um, down there. Um, that might come out when we have the eDNA sampling results, um, if they're able to pick up any hydrocarbons in those samples. So I don't know that question. That is an excellent one. 
And someone asked, I think this was from a question earlier on, um, is, the, is that coral the oldest living animal on earth? That's another, a great question I don't know. Um, it's, it should, could be it's something to look up, I'm not sure. And I think there could, who knows, there could be more things that are hidden. And another question, why are metabolic processes, processes generally slower in deeper waters compared to shallower ones? Well, the cold, cold water means everything slows down for um, those animals that live there. They just have very slow metabolic processes because it's super cold water. And if they needed to maintain higher metabolic processes, they need a lot more food and energy to maintain those. So being that they're kind of dependent on whatever rains down from above, um, and it's not exactly the most nutrient dense stuff to get the leftovers from decomposition, um, their metabolic rates are, are much lower. There's a lot less oxygen. This is the oxygen minimum zone. So um, a very stable environment in terms of temperature. It's very, very stable, but that makes for those animals to adapt to those conditions to live in a slower environment like that. All right. All right. Are there more expeditions planned? Do we work with Ambari? Well, this year, I. The, well, the Ocean Exploration Trust explores every year, and you can look at nautiluslive.org, I'll type that in in a minute, to find out where they're exploring this year. I believe they're doing a couple expeditions on the West Coast between Channel Islands, Monterey Bay, and I, I think a little bit in Farallons too. Um, we're not sure what they're gonna look like at this point because of the COVID-19, and normally there's a crew of 31 to run these missions, and with uh, the concern about health, they're probably going to be less less people on board, but still exploring and probably still beaming live. NOAA Ocean Exploration, um, there's NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration as well, and they also do these live expeditions that beam live um, streams to the internet. Um, we haven't had any of them here on the West Coast, but they do some amazing exploration too. So yes, and then with Ambari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, they prim primarily focus their work in the Monterey Bay Canyon, Monterey Canyon, and do an amazing work um, with their science and their sampling and their research that they're doing in the deep sea. I don't believe they do any live feeds, but they do have amazing um, resources on their website of photos and video clips from their, um, their findings and um, also put their stuff out on social media. So it's another awesome resource source to learn about deep sea environments through Mbari. Let's see, oh, got some more questions. Uh, and I'm gonna just take, I think two more and then Jessica and Morgan, I know um, you would like to come on and answer some questions too. Do sea slugs live in the deep water? Yes, we did see some cool nudibranchs down there. In fact, I know we collected one um, to send to Cal Academy to be identified. Um, do the samples survive the pressure changes of being brought to the surface? Um, well, I wouldn't say they're alive when they come to the surface because they're coming also up at a very high rate, but we don't, we haven't collected any vertebrates. Vertebrates might be a bit traumatic um, in coming up to the surface, but if they are alive on the way up, I, I've seen amphipods crawling around and sea stars crawling around in those samples and they're still alive. But um, unfortunately, they have to be uh, cured in alcohol to preserve them. So they have to die eventually anyway in order to be um, preserved. We don't collect that many samples. It's really maybe like 10 to 15 samples for a 24-hour dive. So it's, it's a very stringent process. And there's a, a protocol for deciding if there's collection, collection or, collections or not. How do we become an ocean scientist? Yay! Um, well, definitely just by staying to be staying curious and taking classes in science and getting involved and going out to the tide pools. One exciting opportunity coming up is uh, a thing called Snapshot Cal Coast with the California Academy of Sciences. And if you live near the coast or can get access to the rocky intertidal areas, it's a great way to participate in this great citizen science project. And starting to build on experiences like that builds your knowledge and your experience for education. Um, so that's a great way to get started. And there's a lot of great resources online to read more about that. Um, and I, that's it. So I just wanna say thank you for your questions and tuning in. And I hope that everyone will take an action this week that they haven't taken before that's in best interest of the ocean. And if they're picking up trash, doing it safely and staying safe with this incredible, incredibly challenging time that we're having both 
physically and mentally and emotionally and socially. So I hope we're, we're all not, uh, going to emerge stronger and better on the other end of this. Jessica and Morgan, I think you guys should come on now. Oh, there you are there. <laughs> I didn't see you. <laughs> we just popped on right now. I just wanted to say um, it's really amazing to hear from both of you. Um, Jenny, thanks so much for partnering with EAC to put on this wonderful Oceans Day celebration um, webinar about Westmoreland's wild oceans. And as you can see from the maps that Morgan and Jenny have supplied, there's uh, amazing protections in this area, but even with those protections, uh, they're susceptible to climate change and fisheries and oil spills and things like that. So our work uh, as partners continues to go on and individually what we work on as well. So I encourage you guys to check out both Cordell Bank and EAC to see what we're doing locally here in West Marin. Um, and then as you can see, there's a lot of ways to take action. You wanna become a scientist? Definitely stay in school, kids. Um, but uh, also there's a lot of ways to get involved, whether it's working with MPA Watch, volunteering potentially with your marine sanctuaries, but also the park service here is a great resource and they have an elephant seal program, which is highly intense for volunteers and you learn a lot and you build a strong community. So that's a great way to learn. And then um, of course, I'll, if there's other questions, I'm gonna let Jenny moderate those cause I don't have them, but I do wanna remind you folks that, um, that I see some of you are folks that have attended our Point Reyes Birding and Nature Festival webinars. So thanks for participating in those. And if you haven't, um, those are online now at pointraysbirdingfestival.org. And if you wanna learn more about your oceans and marine mammals, the things that we tend to see on top of the sea when we're out visiting the lighthouse and such, uh, Sarah Allen did a great marine mammal webinar for us. And that is now available for your leisure online as well as many other little things. But that concludes our presentation. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day. Take care.